Hello, Stroka. <laughs> wow, there are so many people here tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm kind of blown away by the response. I hope you find what I have to say worthwhile. Uh, so let me get started by loading up my images here. Okay, so for this first part of the talk, what you'll see on the screen comes from my personal Tumblr, which is just the Tumblr microblog, uh, which I use as, oh. let's go back, uh, which I use as a space to publish my own work. So everything you're going to see on the screen in this first part of the talk comes from it's my work, it's from my practice, so I'll explain a little bit more about these images in a little moment. But first I wanted to tell you a little bit about me and about the work that I do, because I'm sure that not all of you are familiar with me. Uh, my name's David, I'm a graphic designer, I'm from London, and my path into graphic design was, I think, somewhat unconventional in that I didn't have a conventional design education, and a lot of my practice is self-taught, but I think also the decision to pursue graphic design and become a graphic designer came about as a result of me starting from a place where I had a lot of questions about the medium, about design, about how it operated as a, a social construct, its industry practices, and there's still ones which I'm figuring out the answers to. And hopefully over the course of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about my practice, the way that I work, some of the things which might be strange or specific to me. I'll talk a little bit about my views of contemporary design practice, how it works at an industrial level, but also at a smaller scale. I'll talk about my ideas of how moving forward, some of the problems that design faces now and how we might find solutions to things which are intrinsic to it as a commercial practice, but also as a personal practice too. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about other practices outside of design, which might hold some answers or illuminate some potential strategies, which design itself seems to have been slow in adopting. And I'm going to finish by looking at some trends that have emerged in a completely different medium in cinema, which I think illustrates some of the ways in which technological change and the way in which technology portrays and presents reality to the viewer is changing our society and is changing individuals' perceptions of what society is, of what reality is, in ways that design should be at least considerative of. Because I think it poses questions for the future of the medium and potentially answers for how we shape our practices going forward. So to start off a bit about me. I grew up in London, in northwest London, in a little village called Lechmore Heath. And Long before uh, I ever even encountered graphic design, uh, I, it's fair to say that as a child, it's not like I had ambitions of being a graphic designer. My first real encounter with design, or the one that I think stands out to me, uh, which maybe illustrates the ways in which my relationship to design may have been fucked up from the start, is uh, <laughs> something that I remember from when I was a little boy, around my eighth birthday. Uh, it was just before my eighth birthday, in fact. I'm born on January the 4th, and this was around Christmas time. I was traveling in the car with my parents, and a song came on the radio, and it was True Faith by New Order. And I loved it. I, it, just, it was amazing to hear this song. I, I hadn't heard New Order before, and it was, I remember it just having a really big impact on me. A few days after that, my parents asked me, what I would like for my birthday, which was coming up, and I just said, I want the New Order album. I didn't know which album. And they didn't know which album either, so they got me the best of New Order. And the best of New Order had just been released, so it also came with a second disc called The Rest of New Order. So I got these two albums. And I don't know if anyone in the audience is a New Order fan, but uh, 
these two albums are, it's the New Order album with the blue squiggle on the front. Uh, <laughs> looks kind of like a question mark. This is a strange squiggle. And then the rest of is exactly the same, but it has a pink squiggle on the front. And I didn't know it as a kid with these two albums, which are the only music I owned, just of these two CDs, and I had a CD player, a little CD player in my room, and I used to sit on the floor just listening to, these al just listening to the New Order album on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. Um, and these two albums, of course, are designed by Peter Saville, the, the legendary English designer who did a little work for Factory Records, worked with Joy Division and worked with New Order uh, early in their careers, throughout their careers. And so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this album, which is, you know, kind of blowing me away, listening to the best of again and again and again. You know, Blue Monday, True Faith, Regret, World, all these amazing tracks. And of course, like you do when you're a kid and you've got nothing else to do, like I'm reading the booklet obsessively back to front, I'm just reading everything in there. It's just like the, you know, who, who produced the song. It was a session engineer. But I'm just looking over it again and again and again. And of course, I don't know it at the time, but it's Savile, so it's in Rotis. This is like a weird choice of typeface for that moment. He's printed it in a spot silver Pantone. I remember I hadn't seen silver ink before. I'm just kind of fascinated. The whole thing was this synthesis of my love for the music and this, this mysterious, beautiful, strange object that wasn't giving me any answers. Uh, it was just, it was there and it felt, I'm just being totally fascinated by it. So that's, that's one part of this encounter. The second part though is that when I'd listened to the best of again and again and again and again and again, and I'd heard all these songs that I liked a million times, that's when I opened up the rest of, uh, which is the remix album. Now bear in mind I'm eight years old um, and I've definitely never been to a club before. And the only music I've ever heard is the music I've heard on the radio or on commercials. So you've got to imagine this eight-year-old kid in his bedroom listening to the New Order album again and again and again. And he puts on the rest of, and I'm like flicking through the tracks. I remember getting to track eight, which is the pump panel remix of Confusion. Those of you who are film fans might remember this is the music that's played in the club scene in Operation Blade. Uh, the, in, in Blade, sorry, the Wesley Snipes vampire flick where they have the blood rave. Um, this track is just like a classic hard house track. It's, it's 10 minutes long, and it's basically just a bass line and a kick drum. And I'm sitting there on my bedroom floor, aged eight, listening to this, and I'm just like, what is this song? Like, where are the words? What is this person trying to say? Like, why did they write this song? What's it about? I don't know what dancing is. I don't know what club music is. But I'm just kind of, I think that was my first experience of abstract art. It was like seeing Kandinsky for the first time. There were no clues, there were no lyrics, there was no imagery. It was just a feeling. And it really stayed with me. Uh, this experience of this language which was so stripped down, so pure and so powerful that I think that though it would only emerge years later in my practice when I start working with underground electronic musicians and I start getting into design more, I am very, very grateful to the fact that I had this album and it was designed by Savile and I didn't know this and that the baseline of everything I believed in about design and music came from something that meant a lot to me. But years pass. I, I grew up in northwest London and then I become a teenager and I'm thinking of what I want to do with my life and I know that I like art, I know that I like drawing, I know that I like making images and visual culture. I think maybe I want to be an artist, but I also feel strongly that I don't want to just go to art school. Uh, I thought maybe I'd try and study philosophy. I wanted to have some kind of framework, some kind of grounding in what it was that my visual medium was in the context of, some notion of social ideas or historical ideas. This wasn't really very thought through, uh, but I felt that I wanted to try and do both of these at the same time. And um, through a convoluted process of me continually trying to get into Oxford and failing to get into Oxford, I eventually ended up getting into Yale in America, where very quickly I realized that I didn't want to study studio art, and I didn't think that I was really an artist, and that I also didn't really like studying philosophy either, and I didn't really know what to do uh, until I found art history, history of art. Uh, 
specifically one brilliant teacher at Yale, a man named Christopher Wood, who had an absolutely extraordinary, very singular, he's young, he's still, he still teaches today, he's at NYU now, but he has books, and, and for anyone who finds what I talk about today interesting, or wonder where my perspectives come from, I would say that Christopher Wood is definitely someone who's worth looking into. He has one fantastic book called uh, uh, Replica Forgery in Fiction, but basically Christopher Wood just teaches the theory of the Northern Renaissance. So the kind of the period of the 14th century to the 15th century, uh, kind of 1450 to 1520, 1530, and in Northern Europe. So Flanders, Germany, Belgium, Holland, this area that it's... When people talk about the Renaissance as a, as a social construct, as a kind of, even as a, a philosophical construct, what our society has kind of landed on as that idea is really the Italian Renaissance, which is the refinement of humanism into this uh, what seems to be a very clean, enlightened form where traditional structures of power, the church, economic structures, social structures, were augmented by philosophy, by art, which seemed to fit seamlessly into this new world. This wasn't the case in the North. In the North, everything was going kind of fucking crazy. And uh, in, in 1430s, movable type is invented. They get books for the first time. And this just immediately starts fucking shit up on a quite broad social level. Because now you have books being made that aren't even the Bible. And so you have a, a Catholic Christian society which is suddenly getting all these texts being revived from antiquity. You're getting humanist stuff. And this is happening in Italy too, but the Northern seem to have a singularly weird interest in wanting to find stuff that previously was totally arcane and taboo. And then, in addition to movable type, you get the invention of... Uh, the refinement of woodblock printing with people like Jura, Albrecht Jura, who turns up in the 1490s. And basically, you get texts and more importantly, images circulating outside of the traditional confines of the church and of religious centers for the first time, which kind of starts to put a, like a pressure cooker under everything in society. People are seeing images of non-religious subjects for the first time. People are reading books about this stuff. And it's starting to create a radically an emergent class of people who are literate, who have a new sense of what the visual order of the world might be. And politically, it's clear that like, this state of affairs is, is becoming problematic. Similarly, in fine art, in refined art, in the high arts, in painting, in the North, the artists now, a generation we move on into like the early 1500s, and these kids who've been raised on seeing prints that aren't just religious prints, images of, of pornography, of, uh, you know, of, of social scenes, of a kind of, of, of you know, a radically broad spectrum of content, now they start making art. And the second gen comes in, and that's where stuff gets really, really dangerous. Because they start putting images out into the religious sphere, altarpiece paintings, etc., which seem to question the very foundations of what the society was built on and its morality. In 1512, Grunewald paints the Eisenheim altarpiece, uh, which I write my dissertation on. Uh, and very, very, very soon after, this generation of incredibly talented, totally heroic punks, weirdos. I mean, like, don't take my word for it. Read Leo Sternberg's The Sexuality of Christ. Everything up to and including, you know, Christ on the cross with an erection, the Virgin Mary uh, explicitly sexually aroused with the young Christ, stuff that it, it's insane for me to say this really happened, but it did in the north. Uh, and then everyone knows about Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. What we don't learn as much about are some of the other people who lead to the religious reformation of that moment, which is Jacob Zwingli and some of his contemporaries equally on the cusp of Luther's reforms, who comes in and says, okay, the church is economically and spiritually corrupt, we need to reform it. Zwingli and his contemporaries come in in 1516, and they say, we have to ban art. This shit is out of control. It's got to stop. Like, they are, they're destroying everything with this crazy art, these crazy punks, and we have to, we have to end it. And so that's why when the Protestant Reformation occurs, yes, the church reforms economically, but also iconoclastically, art is stripped out of the churches. And an attempt is made to strip art out of society. Spoiler warning, it doesn't work. But that's the pressure that the North is under. And this is the background that I'm getting my design education in. I'm watching a world in which printing books and making images 
literally was the equivalent of like a terrorist attack that nearly destroyed society. And then that might help explain why when I came out of this art history and I start working with musicians and I start working with artists whose practices just really inspire me and I, I start getting the chance to even you know, make a poster for them or do stuff. My fundamental attitude towards what design and visual communication is, is that this isn't necessarily something that has no stakes. This isn't necessarily work that just is there to make the world beautiful. Making the world beautiful can kind of fuck up the world as well. And I start looking as well in this time where I'm learning about this information revolution and this is you know, my early 20s and it becomes really, really clear to me that we're also going through our own information revolution in our time. There's eerie similarities that start to emerge. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at Yale when Facebook's launched, so I, start, I mean, like, the first people who are getting on this first gen of social media, and it's very, very clear that what the internet is becoming is similar to what printed books and printed images had been for that previous generation, which is, this was a radical upturning of the hierarchies and orders of how information, knowledge, truth, the sacred, the profane, were ordered in our world. And it was clear as well, having known the way the previous one turns out, that it wasn't necessarily something that was just gonna end up fine and everything would be the same as before. Whether or not we got there, the potential was here for a crisis or a reshaping that would be total, would change the way all of our lives would work. In one generation, Northern Europe went from one which was psyched about the possibilities of this emerging medium to one that was basically in a civil war, saying, uh, we need to shut this down right now. And so the whole way through the emergence of my practice, there is this weight that is always in the room, which is the sense that we don't know how this is going to end. We don't know necessarily that things will end up one way or the other, but we are in a moment with the potential for a, it being part of a radical restructuring of how visual communication works, how graphic language works, how we view ourselves, how we view identity, how we view politics and how we view society, and that the control factors in this moment might not be disseminated from the top down. That there may be movements that authorities might make or great institutions might make to control it, but these might not be sufficient to keep the genie in the bottle. In fact, my belief is, as I will talk about when I articulate what I think this is as a moment of crisis and of opportunity, that whether we like it or not, design and its role has fundamentally changed and that we must find ways to adapt to the new models that are being propagated by things bigger than design, new platforms, new modes of communication, and new understandings, ultimately, of how we even view reality. So, let's get back to me. I graduate from university and I start a design practice working mostly with musicians and artists. Uh, and basically this is just me kind of being, uh, I don't know, I, like just almost kind of an intervention in that like I would go to clubs and I would hear DJs play that I loved and I would just ask them if I could do a poster or can I make a t-shirt for you. Uh, there were artists who I thought were doing really interesting work and I wanted to work with them. I think that I, at the very beginnings of my practice, it's not like I emerged with an ideology where I was like, okay, I want to do graphic design because it's going to be really important and I have to be there and I have to do it and I have to do it a certain way. Everything I'm going to talk about now is something which has emerged over the course of time, over the course of my experiences doing work and it's something which is still changing and still evolving. Anyone among you who have a design practice will probably have gone through some things that I described, similar things yourself. And similarly, I don't think I'm at a position yet where I would say, ah, oh, I have the answer, I have the theory of what design is, of what it will be. But I do think that being on the front lines, so to speak, our generation, the young generation, emergent generation, people who are, well, there's two generations really of designers that are emergent now. One is my generation, I'm 31 years old, who grew up and had our formative design experiences without the internet. So our first design objects, our intimacies with the medium, were probably physical things, like the New Order album I loved. There's another generation out there now that will form the bulk of what graphic design becomes in the next 10 years. And that's really one of the things which like, I want you to bear in mind as I go through this talk. And that is the generation of graphic designers 
whose formative design experiences took place online, who don't necessarily have what most in this audience will have, which is a fundamental reverence for the idea that a book is necessary or important, an LP is necessary or important. Uh, we can make strong cases, and I believe many of you do, and I try to myself as to why we think these things are important, but let's be clear, we should also prepare strategies or prepare ourselves looking forward to the future of design with the knowledge that it's not just a de facto obvious necessary condition of design, that it needs be physical or needs even recognize the physical world. And I think that this has strong implications for some of the ways in which perhaps design has taken for granted the way that the physical might need to be argued for in its future and that we as the makers of objects or as the makers of visual culture may need to start putting forward a case as to why this is important. It's no longer necessarily just an assumption that your audience will agree with you. So we should consider this and I'll talk about some ways in which we might look to do this in how we structure our practices and structure our studios. So I start doing this work and <laughs> After a couple of years, I'm kind of actually in a kind of bad place by the time I get to my mid-twenties in that I'm doing this work and I'm kind of like working with musicians I like, but as anyone who's tried to start a practice completely independently or, or work on music stuff will tell you, it doesn't pay well at all. You don't know where the work is coming from. It's not easy and I'm kind of broke and I'm getting to this point where I'm really feeling pretty low. Couple this with the fact that I'm not someone who wanted to ever call themselves a graphic designer and I was kind of ashamed to even say it because I had these suspicions that the things I was trying to do in my work were totally at odds with the way that the industry seemed to frame itself, seemed to consider itself as an entity. I have strong skepticisms, I still do, about the current state of commercial design. I believe my desire to work with people who were expressive, who were visual artists or, or, or musicians or writers, uh, and to express also myself and to create cultural content that I thought had value and would uh, be meaningful to viewers is a skill that I think you have to spend time as a designer consciously refining. You can't just move from a place of doing a lot of work that you don't care about to passionate work and then suddenly realize, okay, but how do I express that passion and what does it mean to me? I'm gonna talk a little bit about the way now a designer might start to form that process for themselves. Those of you who have practices, the consideration of how does a designer create expression? How does a designer embrace poetry or attempt to do something that is striking whilst working in a medium that fundamentally also is still going to be held to standards where it must deliver some kind of solution or concrete act. It can't just be like an artist to completely obtuse. Because if the viewer disregards it or rejects it, then you really haven't helped out the person whose album cover you were designing or whose book you were doing the cover of. So I want to talk a little bit about how design lives in the world. I know a lot of people feel that like ultimately the agency of a designer is very little. And it's true on an individual level, this, these fantasies, these notions of oh, we're changing the world have to stop. In that we are not saving the world, we're not changing it from the top down as individuals. But what we are doing, all of us cumulatively, in our work is we are creating and cumulatively recreating the world of the now. We build designers, architects, industrial designers, the objects, the typefaces, the voices, which become our milieu, our midst, our surroundings between us. And we can no longer disregard the extent to which, by creating the world, we are also partially responsible for the political and social content of that world. It is not a coincidence that if you make a social network that aims to have a billion users and you use design solutions to make all the content appear friendly, that when neo-Nazis get on that network, suddenly they appear way more friendly than before. It's not a coincidence that if you spend your life as a designer proudly when a client comes to you and says, hey, people don't trust our company, 
can you make it so that they trust us? But actually the company's still doing the same stuff they were doing before. You just affect the voice of a trustworthy person that after a while, people get wise to the fact that they're still getting ripped off and scammed. And they start, whenever they see fresh new graphic design, conflating it with being lied to. As designers, we all need to start looking at the fundamentals of our interactions with design and what we put out there because ultimately, thank you, don't worry, back from the screensaver. Because ultimately, if design sees itself as a service whose goal is to address the problems of the client, then design is ignoring what it really is, which is design is an environment for its audience. We need to reject the notion, I feel I do in my practice, but I feel that this is something which is a bit of a taboo for designers to discuss, that the people we work for are our clients. The people we work with should be our clients. The people we work for are our audience. Neglect that and you start to build dystopias because you start to create systems of manipulation, systems of control, ways which your service is you make it easier for someone to lie, for them to change their appearance so that they can take on the most commercially profitable position, but you lose the hard work, the tough work, which modernism rightly claimed credit for, which is the idea that design is a practice with serious stakes that involves responsibilities and involves offering real meaningful change to its audience. I'm going to use a term now, and I hope it comes through in, in Russian. Uh, I hope also what I'm saying is intelligible to those of you who don't speak English. Um, but I'll try and explain this as simply as possible. There's a word I use, and it may be a long time before I finally get to the, the full end of philosophically what this means. But um, there's a word I use when I try and talk about how experience from design registers in, in the world, in people. And I use this word narrative in a way that's different to the conventional idea of narrative as a story or a tale. Uh, and it's, it's a simple distinction, but it's just something that I think it's worth designers thinking about. And, and, and the way I use it is this. If I say a word to you, and let's say that word has a visual connotation, like I say a chair, Every one of you in your head will, will have some chair that you picture. That image or that idea of what a chair is will be different for all of you because it, will be, it can necessarily only be built out of all of your own individual experiences of what a chair is. Imagine you know, that we're Google servers, for example, and all of us have an index of every chair we've ever seen, or more particularly, every chair perhaps that we can remember. And maybe for certain individuals, some chairs, the chair in your family's house, the one in your bedroom, you saw more than most. And so maybe for some of you, your chair looks a bit more like that. Or maybe something terrible happened to you in a room with that chair, and actually for some of you, the chair isn't the nice thing at all, or you're now picturing something you don't want to think about. This is what I call the narrative, which is that chair is a noun, it's a term. The narrative is an individual's unique experience of the term. What a designer does every time we put work in front of people is we are making a conscious intervention into their narratives. We are becoming a moment in the history of something. And the opportunity is there, if we choose to pursue it, to try and make this perhaps a defining or useful moment in the history of something, which means for it to be useful, it has to stand out, it has to be remembered, and it has to have some connotations which are perhaps maybe indicative of something. Maybe they speak to something else. Maybe it's like, okay, this chair actually, and we talk about this when we talk about art, oh, okay, this chair stands for murder or political corruption. You don't have to go to the gallery to view the world like that. We have the opportunity to do that in our work. When we make an album cover, when we make a poster, we also have the opportunity far away from the client to speak on a very direct level to people and create their associations with things. How in my practice did I feel 
I think it, like the revelation for me when I felt like I was gaining some control over that process, how might you as designers think about this as well, came when I started to work more and more with type and type design. I'm, I guess it's one of the defining aspects of my practice. All of the type that you're seeing on this screen, all of it, even the boring typefaces that look kind of like Helvetica are pretty much 99% of them are ones I designed. Uh, when I do my work, and it's something that I don't like to try and foreground, is I don't want the work to be showing off about this, this, this uh, component of it, but it's important to me as part of my process that I make the type from the ground up. Why do I do this? Firstly, it means that everything I do will have something slightly off about it, something slightly specific, even in the basic typefaces, even in the one pure there, for example, which is a typeface called Zoa, that might make it more memorable, might make it a way in which whatever is specific about that work might find its form within you. And the second is it allows me to reach back into the thing that I love so much, history and the past and this great wealth of experience and cultures and my memories and feel like I'm able to pull them in to these objects, to find a way to say, if I want to talk about a chair, but I also want to talk about the, hit, the legacy of the Baroque, for example, in this poster, maybe I can do that with type, and maybe there's a way to, to highlight the unique synthesis between these two strange things by coming up with a typeface which is the only place in the world it would ever need to exist, which has both qualities of a chair and qualities of the Baroque. It's the opposite of Vignelli's theorem, which is a designer should just have like five good typefaces and throw the rest away, and those are the only ones you use, because I think that that's actually a kind of honestly slightly fascist way of looking at what culture is and what the world is. Every single person in this room has a history and an experience which is made up of memories and made up of narratives. They are unique to you. Design should find ways to be more embracing of difference, not less. Design should find ways to showcase the breadth of culture and possibility in history and make individuals as well feel that design is something which could ultimately be a place that they could explore their own personal space rather than some kind of unifying social factor that they need to pull towards. If you feel you have a different space to go to, design can actually be an opportunity potentially to put that liberation on the table, to suggest what other worlds might look like. And if we don't find ways of stimulating people's imagination or dreams of what might be, then the danger is that as a society we go more and more and more closed. And design also becomes a practice which becomes relegated to bigger and bigger and bigger organizations because the individual doesn't matter. Your perspective is not what they're looking to communicate. They're looking to communicate this massive social homogeneity. And that's why I think, and I will go on to express, that I think the future of the design is finding ways to be radically autonomous as both individuals and small groups of individuals so you can celebrate your perspective, your memories, your narratives. Now, a little aside before I go into talking about how I think we can go about doing that. The first thing that I want to talk about, just one more thing to do with type, is a category of language which, because I was teaching myself this stuff, became really important to me, and then when I tried to look into later in my career why, you know, what was the relationship in design, no one really talks about this. So I figure, like, I'm here, I'm talking to you guys, maybe I should, should mention this. And that is a category of language that in English we call proper nouns. A proper noun is really simple. Everyone in this room has one. It's your name, for a start. But it's also a specific date or a specific place, Moscow is a proper noun, Russia is a proper noun. And when you think about the world in terms of narratives, proper nouns are very special because in the same way that your narrative extends only all the way back to you, a proper noun also is a weird moment where it extends also to this single point. And I was working as a designer and realizing that actually, okay, when, as a designer, you get asked to work, there's certain indexes of information, and we talk about headline and body, we talk about display and text, but actually we don't talk about proper nouns, and they're the place where the really crazy shit potentially goes down. The stuff where, if we talk about like design potentially having a social footprint, or having 
a great being able to change the meaning of something for hundreds of thousands or millions of people well look at proper nouns if I say joy division or new order or you know an individual's name for example in your head I know that some of you, for example, are picturing the cover of Unknown Pleasures by Peter Saville, the Joy, Joy Division album. I can make you, if I say chair, I can't get close to what your chairs look like. But if I say Unknown Pleasures, I can get pretty close. And I can start to think about the ways in which now you've all got a pretty similar picture in your heads. It's because Unknown Pleasures is a proper noun. And as a designer, when you get asked to do an album, or you get asked to do a monograph, you actually get the moment where, and this is unbelievable privilege and this is the thing which it doesn't matter if you're making five bucks a month you're struggling on the breadline and believe me I was you get to be the person if you can find a way to work with a musician if you can find a way to work with an artist if you can find a way to do these jobs where you get to define what that proper noun looks like and that is a place in history from day one if that thing gets referenced you are controlling that space of the narrative so if you're listening to my earlier part of the talk and you're like, yes, yeah, so what? I make a typeface that looks like a chair. I'm not going to change the way anyone thinks about chair. True, probably correct. But you can change the way that someone pictures joy division. You can change the meaning of what that is. And if people keep acquainting themselves with that content that you touched in that way, and typographically that's one of the best ways to do it, if you can design the word itself, then you have an enormous amount of agency. That's where you can really do the, the, the magical work of designer's poetry, right in that space. So I would say to designers who are looking at their own practices and how do I work, how do I, you know, how do I build a name for myself, well, you should, one thing I would definitely advise that you can do, even when you're just starting out, is be super receptive to the power of proper nouns, like call us on that, that album just there, for example, because that is a place where if you can fix an idea that's unique to you, unique to that thing in that place, you'll always own the way it looks. Even if people rip you off, they're ripping you off. You're the source. You were there on day one. You were there at the kind of creation of the memory for that individual. Those words had no meaning before for them, and now they are a thing. You're top of the filing cabinet in their mind. Okay, so practices. How do we build our practices going forward? At this point, I kind of want to make a bit of a swerve. I want to show a video. Um, I want to show a couple of clips from a show that's on Netflix. I don't know if any of you are Netflix subscribers, but a really wonderful, fantastic show called Chef's Table. Um, if we can put those, those clips on now. Um, these clips won't have sound, so there'll just be a few clips, but I'll kind of talk over and I'll narrate uh, a little bit. If we have the video. So Chef's Table is a Netflix show that follows the practice of, for one hour, one individual chef. Uh, a chef who is the head creative persona of a fine dining restaurant. I think this term is important, and I'm sorry, I don't know what the term is in Russian, for fine dining, because bear in mind that all these things I'm going to say about cooking and the kitchens and the way this global culture works, I want us to consider in the context of graphic design practice today. Imagine if the only restaurants that existed around the world were McDonald's or global chains, huge mega conglomerates whose goal was just to feed the kind of everyday desires of, of the public, to sate their hunger. But there was not necessarily a word like they have in cooking, fine dining, for someone whose job it is to refine their practice to the highest level of a culinary art to express, to entertain, to create unique memories. We don't have this term in graphic design. I'm proud to call myself a graphic designer because the worst thing you can do is say to that person, okay, you're an artist now. All right, you're trying to make this stuff meaningful. You've stopped doing graphic design. The moment we start saying that is the moment that we close ourselves off to the possibility that design can even be a terrain of expression. So with the greatest of respect, fuck that. I'm a graphic designer. I want to call myself that even if that was a term which previously I wasn't so comfortable with. This show is amazing. It's incredible, beautifully edited, incredibly shot. I recommend, I'm going you know, to sound like a Netflix commercial for a moment here, but please, if you can, watch this show. Uh, the clips I'm going to show you here won't do justice to the little things, but I wanted you to see just a little bit, because I didn't just want it to be words in your mind. This is an opportunity for me to put images too with Chef's Table. 
time and time and time again. I watched this, I first saw this a year ago, at a time where I had graduated from Yale and I felt very frustrated with the state of graphic design as a profession. I couldn't necessarily see a way for me to move forward and find a way to express myself in the way I wanted. What would my practice look like? What would I even call myself? How would I structure it? Finding this show was amazing for me. It really was. It was a revelation because here I saw individuals who were operating 20 years into graphic design's future. So liberated creatively, conceptually, but so aware and intelligent because of the nature of their practice about all of the possibilities. These aren't casual artisans. To run a fine dining restaurant, you take on an enormous economic burden. You take on incredible stress. You're there 22 hours a day. You have to basically go out on a limb or find investors to get a property, and you need a space. You can't run a restaurant off the internet. If you start running the restaurant, you have to have a space, and that means that that space needs to visually reflect as well the environment of what it is you're trying to express, because these chefs know in a way designers don't seem to have cottoned on to, all about what I was describing when I talked about narrative, which is the first moment you walk in through the door, it matters. The smell of the room matters. You hear them talk about it. They talk about using ambient music. They talk about the color of the walls. They talk about the lighting. They talk about the service interactions. Sorry, but this makes design look like kids' stuff. Because we should be thinking about all this stuff, but we don't talk about it. We talk about typefaces and color schemes and doing a sick poster or doing the cover of the book. But how many of us are talking about creating the smell of the place that people first encounter the book? No, maybe in 20 years, but they're there already. The chefs are there, and they're talking about it, and they're learning from it, and what they're learning is amazing. This stuff really, really, really is relevant to what we do as creative professionals, because they have to think about where they get their ingredients from, which is a local thing, because they need their ingredients. So they think about their supply chain, they think about their materials, they get to know the ecological impact of their use of materials. They have to manage that as well as a budget so they can't make too many sacrifices. And they also know the way in which that then has knock-on effects on the local community. Well, as a designer, if you make a book, you've got to find paper, you've got to find a printer, you've got to develop those relationships. For these chefs, that's a huge part of their creative practice. For designers, especially if you work in a firm, that might be someone else's job. But these people, are finding ways to differentiate themselves to further what they do by refining all of these elements. Then we get onto the creative side, what they do with it. Well, if you have a restaurant, you also need a kitchen. This is super important. We have one word in graphic design for the creative atelier, the studio. One word. That's kind of equivalent to something, something similar to the kitchen, but not really. Not really. The studio and graphic design is kind of where you take your phone calls and a little bit of the desk that you do your work on. But these guys, the kitchen, or these girls as well, these ladies and men, because there's just as many incredible female chefs as there are men, have not just a space for making, but a space for creating, laboratories, research labs. They take time in their week to go off the floor, they'll have days when the restaurant is closed, and they'll do pure R&D. They talk about going on research trips, pure research trips, to further the development of the kitchen, and then coming back to this tiny space and pushing things further there. Because you cannot survive as a top-level, Michelin-starred chef unless you're doing something that is truly, almost indescribably unique to you, and it has to be brilliant every time. Everyone who walks in the door of that restaurant is expecting it to blow their minds. Imagine if, as designers, we had that kind of level that we were aiming for. Every single thing we put out had to be a revelation, had to be something that was just a world we hadn't imagined before. And it should be meaningful too, not just because there are people in the, in the culinary profession for whom it's a pure expression of ego, but they can't rise to the top because ultimately it's unsatisfying for their audience for them to just show off about the cool techniques that they could pick up or the stuff they could bite from other chefs. No, the synthesis really needs to be there day in, day out for these stories to have meaning to the viewers. And how do these chefs reach that point? Time and time and time again in chef's table. And it, it almost made me want to cry seeing it. It was amazing. Independently, these people who've had no formal training, they didn't go to a school, they didn't study philosophy, they identify through working at these practices in this way that the most important tool that they have to work with 
as creative professionals is memory. When people come in and they sit down, the way that the chef can provoke them or surprise them is by playing off their memories or expectations of what food is. And they can reward them by awakening nostalgias or forgotten pasts, but they can also push them in the opposite direction, push against their expectations too. And similarly for the chef, how do they keep coming up with ideas? Day in, day out, how do they push forward? Again, it is memory which is the foundation of these practices. Now, what does it mean for us as designers? Well, first off, if we're gonna have labs, and if we're gonna have spaces where we're gonna have practices that could be expressive, whilst still being held to the highest technical standards, then similar to these chefs, we're gonna have to go out on a limb and try and build some idea for ourselves, some discussion of what these environments look like. What is a laboratory for graphic design? What is the restaurant equivalent in graphic design? If the studio is the perfect kitchen, how is it reaching its audience? Are we going to change the ways that design reaches its audience, even down to the idea of the smell of the book or the environment of the retail space? Ultimately, for me, the excitement of what the next years of graphic design might hold is a move away from a top-down enormous, bloated, and frankly, dying commercial model of mega industrial design. Every person who has the internet now, to a certain extent, is a designer. We all post images on our social media feeds or on Twitter. If you're a kid, you're using Snapchat and Instagram every day to create stories. They are editors, they are coordinators. And we risk also running into a point where we will have billions of graphic designers. And there are only so many jobs at the top firms. And at the top firms, there are only really five or six people who are truly being creative. When you come in through the door, like you do at a great kitchen, they don't tell you in graphic design that for the first three years, you're going to be a dishwasher. But here's the other thing about the kitchen, which graphic design doesn't do as well. When you go and work for Alain Passard, or you go and work for any of these great chefs, you're being trained to become a great chef yourself. And in the current state of the industry, I feel our generation has been somewhat tricked. We are not being trained to run the companies. We're not really being trained to lead. There's too many of us out there. The marketplace is oversaturated with young designers. We are being trained to become the workforce. This can and will only change when we start establishing studios, ateliers of our own that need to be smaller, more flexible, and to support one another. So, just as fine dining can exist in any city of the world, in fact, in season three of uh, Chef's Table, uh, Vitaly Mukhtin's White Rabbit, which is here in Moscow, is featured, uh, and has a reason to exist in every city of the world, because in every city of the world, people want to experience these moments of, of, of great excitement and provocation. Uh, and every city as well has its unique cultural geography, its unique tastes, Every person in those cities has different memories. Your memories of food as Muscovites will be so different to my memories of London, which means the great restaurant of Moscow should be very different to the great restaurants of London. And actually, there's enough of you in this room with different enough memories that there should be 50 great restaurants in Moscow. It's the same with design studios. There should be 50 great design studios in Moscow, drawing on your local heritage, drawing on your culture, finding ways to change that voice into visual form. And there should be in London, and Birmingham, and Ghent, and Lyon, and all over the world, we don't need 5,000 people working it into brand. We shouldn't be looking at that future. It's not sustainable anyway. When the Snapchat generation hit the market, I can, I can tell you, those companies are in huge trouble. But what those people will need, in the same way that food has been around, for since humans have been around, we've always needed to eat, is that level beyond mere sustenance. That level which exists as pure expression or communication. And if you think this sounds maybe okay, this is a very elitist vision for graphic design, let me say the following. You're right, it's crazy elitist to point to a meal that costs 200 euros and say that's the future of graphic design. But here's the most magical, wonderful thing. I, I can't afford to go and have a 200 euro meal any night of the week, once a month maybe tops, like maybe once a year for a birthday. But I can afford to buy an album once a month and that costs a lot less than 200 euros. And my parents gave me a CD for my birthday and it changed my life. So as designers, we actually have much more open and broadly sourced points of contact to the public that don't need to be ultra-rarefied luxury objects. The onus is on us to work with those parameters to make them extraordinary. Let me go back to this, but 
maybe it's time for me to move on to the final section of my talk. which is similar to looking at chefs and fine dining and cooking, I want to look at another area outside of graphic design. An area which I think illustrates some of the ways in which when I talk about society changing radically, maybe it doesn't feel so apparent or there'll be people in the room who've worked at companies. It's like, yeah, whatever, man. Like actually, you're alarmist or it's not so much of a change. Although, Increasingly, as time goes on and you look at the political situation of the world, more and more of those people are starting to have to say, okay, you know what, maybe something is changing. But I want to talk about cinema because I'm fascinated by cinema. I love cinema. But cinema is about as mass market and global a medium for popular expression as there is that exists in the world today. Here in Russia, a Hollywood blockbuster, I know that even in this audience of you know, hundreds of people, if I mention the Avengers, or I mention Batman, or I mention Superman, there's a very good chance a lot of you have seen it. Uh, which is crazy. There's very little other cultural property that I can say in that way and feel confident that you'll be familiar with. The thing about cinema is it's an incredibly powerful visual medium that has the potential for creating in its audience a reflection of a worldview or a portrayal of a world that actually design can struggle to keep up with. These incremental changes of legacy media are very slow in our profession compared to the way that uh, cinema has operated. And what I want to talk about is something which I'm not making a claim that this is how all cinema is now. But what I think is interesting is that a visual form has emerged in filmmaking in the last decade or so, which I think better than anything in design and really better than anything in, in literature or better than anything in music, seems to visually represent the nature of how our reality works now and probably bears paying further attention to, as it seems to suggest as well the direction that things are heading in. I want to talk about a kind of filmmaking or a set of filmmaking tropes that I call ultra-reality. And if you can pop the video on, I'll try and explain a little bit of what I mean by that. So this is what I mean by cinema being very recognizable. I think probably a lot of you in the audience are familiar with this scene uh, from The Matrix by the Wachowski sisters from 1999. Uh, this is maybe not the first instance in cinema, but for me, the best origin point in popular culture for the emergence of what would become the tropes of cinematic ultra-reality. I would define ultra-reality as a set of filmmaking decisions that is generally typified by five things. The first of them is well illustrated by the sequence from The Matrix, which is an end or a gradual ending of the idea of linear time as the dominant mode by which story making or narrative is presented. So, in this sequence here, which was referred to as bullet time in the popular press when this came out, they used a variety of cameras to create the sense that the camera was moving impossibly fast in this slow motion shot around Neo. The end of linear time, or the end of a chronology that just starts at A and moves at the same speed to B, is something which actually, on a broader social sense, is starting to become the phenomenon of also how we experience our social reality in social media. More and more news feeds, news organizations, our social contact groups are being structured by our order of interest rather than necessarily a pure chronological sense. It used to be when you started on Facebook, you could scroll down and it was basically like you were following time, but now time is starting to fracture and be out of order on the internet. Time may jump forward or backward to you depending on what is deemed to be most interesting or relevant. And similarly in filmmaking, the special effects sequence was always, slow motion was used at the most dramatic moment, at the, the heightened moment. But now, increasingly, slow motion, filmmakers are finding ways to make the world appear entirely in slow motion, or fast motion, or move seemingly at will between slow and fast motion, forwards and reverse. The idea that stories just take place at one speed in one direction is ending in certain parts of the cinema. And the audience isn't rejecting this. In fact, 
It's kind of becoming part of the way that we see time in a popular sense there, and it's being reflected online as well. This footage is from Carousel by Adam Berg from 2009. This was a commercial that was made for uh, Philips for the, their LCD widescreen televisions. And this was highly lauded at the time. It was actually released online, not in cinemas. What Berg does here is he creates the impression of a single unbroken shot that runs from start to finish and that ends in the place it began. So what we see here is the emergence of the second principle of ultra-reality, which is the movement towards the infinite scroll, the perfect loop, the world that's not interrupted by cuts. Because if you've grown up on the internet, you'd know that cuts are unsophisticated, and infinity is the digital property that the world can't keep up with. So if you have infinite space, why not use it? Why not envision a world that never stops? And if you get used to that, what does it mean to experience something which is edited or cut? The traditional art of cinema or directing was the art of editing. It was of taking life as we experienced it and ordering it in a series of vignettes to tell a story. But that's not necessarily the case anymore in filmmaking. And that's certainly not the case anymore on the internet. What are the implications for graphic design? Well, editing was actually a part of how we saw our medium as well. And when we made books, it was about taking pride in the structured pagination and order, the way in which we showed a system unfolding and iterating over a series of media. But what if a generation is emerging that sees these things as violent interruptions that break down the way in which they want to explore the medium in all directions at once? They don't want to read your book from front to cover. They don't want to read it from page one to page 20, and they certainly don't want to turn the page. It's ugly, it's wrong. Shouldn't information always be moving around, and shouldn't you be able to be free? Which brings me to the third principle of ultra-reality, which is freedom of movement. Increasingly in these shots, we move through the scene, we're moving through time, but we're moving through space in a way where it is clear that the defining principle of what governs our movement and what governs the time is not the physical laws of the space that you're in, but the will of the filmmaker and by extension the will of the camera. These shots where the camera moves completely free creates a radical sense as well in the eyes of the viewer of what cinema is. Because previously, cinema was always this parallax view, this perspective that was a representation of a possible observer. The idea that you might be a voyeur standing in the room whilst the two protagonists fought, witnessing the murder or being present at the court case. But now, a different type of witnessing is taking place, where it is more about the exhilaration and the thrill of flying through the space than necessarily observing it. You are no longer a static point or a moving point that's hypothetically a single standing human being. But as I'll show through these clips, actually, more and more the camera is indifferent to the idea that it might be a plausibly human perspective. Actually, the camera begins to take form a new form, which is a character in and of itself. This perspective is one which viewers, time and again, when they watch cinema, when they go to watch Superman or Batman, whether Superman survives or dies in the end, actually, when they go in the next week and watch Wonder Woman, they're returning to the same myth, the same super story that's being told all across cinema, which is the story of an indestructible camera, a story of a camera that can transcend time and space, a character that people are getting to know very well, because when they navigate the internet now, and they navigate virtual space, and they dream of their future in AR, or they dream of the way in which they may interact with the book of the future, that is their perspective. They are this camera that has been freed from the conventions of what came before. And modernity and modernism, which was the system of the grid, which was the system of horizontal and parallel lines, is irrelevant to the way that these people now view their universe. And so these unfamiliar scenes, where once architecture framed the vignette, where once the grid was how we constructed the book, now characters are being thrown through them. And so we move from a generation that may be bored with the idea of a book with pages to a generation that might be bored with the idea of a book that isn't already on fire or being blown to smithereens or be able to be cast aside into shards and shrapnel. So we move from the fourth principle, which is 360 movement, ending the horizontal, ending the primacy of the horizon as the orienting ground plane on which we construct the world and therefore all modernist grid-based systems that will go with it. Anyone who's designed in AR will tell you 
the potential overlay of that stuff on the physical world, it's no longer parallel and horizontal to the frame. To pitch it into virtual space, you're now moving into curved planes, you're moving into perspectives that are constantly shifting. It's not like a book layout where the layout is grid-based anymore. We move graphic design, and this is one of the defining features that ultra reality will lead for the future of our medium, is a movement from a, from a system of grids to a system of overlays. And these films are showing it better than the design of our age. The final, the final point which I want to make about this, about ultra reality as a medium, the fifth element is, okay, so you get rid of the world, you get rid of the ground plane, you get rid of architecture. Where are we? We're not in some void. Actually, we're in a world that is populated by something. And I'd like to call this mode of viewing camera intifada, which is a pun on camera obscura, the first imaging technology, which is a world composed entirely without gravity, without planes, of shrapnel, of atoms, of shards. It's the ruins of the old world flying all around you at all times, rushing past the viewer's eyes through the frame, into the frame, around, to be determined and played with like debris, like detritus. No longer interesting in their original form, but only interesting to the extent to which they can actually be pushed, played, penetrated, or surrounding. Anyone who's done a VR demo will tell you this is literally the first and only thing VR designers want to do when they make a VR game. They don't know that they're doing it, but they're following from the principles that cinema's already established. This is ultra-reality. But as graphic designers, we should pay serious attention to this because it has big implications for how we view the construction of legacy media, like print, like posters, like books. We should not move under the assumption that these things, these formats, will make sense to the viewer of the future who spends more time on the internet and in the cinema in ultra-reality than in the modernity from which our, our profession emerged. And so, this leads me to my very final point. And afterwards then, happy to take your questions and thank you for bearing with me for such a long time. You guys have really been very great and patient. Which is, what does it mean to live in a universe of ultra-reality? If we move from modernity to this new paradigm, how do we consider our audience as designers? if my plea to you as designers is to consider the audience and not the client. It is the following, and I'm not saying this is a good thing or necessarily a bad thing. It is the crisis of graphic design which we will have to address. And that is the notion that when this is your world, you move from a reality where under modernity, the viewer is an observer of reality to the new paradigm where you are the protagonist of reality. You are the camera that can move in any direction. You are the one who speeds up or slows down time. You select the content you want to see. You scatter the architecture of the world if it's no longer relevant to you. That's how we use the internet, but that's also how increasingly we're viewing our normative modes of reality as well. And so as designers, we need to work together to find solutions to how we build our studios that can operate in this paradigm, but also towards one that still privileges an audience who view themselves as protagonists with wonders worth seeing and dreams worth aspiring to and not give up to the notion that this is now a world in which graphic design has been written out of the picture. Anyway, thank you so much for your time and for bearing with me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>